We're now joined by the Minister for Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship, Mark Miller. Minister, thank you for joining us. Hi, Michael. Listen, I, I, I have to begin here with uh, Yaroslav Hunka. The, the House Speaker, Anthony Rota, accepts responsibility for the invitation. But as you know, the Conservative House Leader uh, says your government is still responsible because if a head of state is speaking in the House, uh, they are a guest of this country and the PMO has an obligation to vet who will be in the House of Commons at that time. Uh, how do you answer that criticism uh, for what is being uh, painted as con by Conservatives as a failure? Well, uh, first, uh, as everyone else in the House, uh, I, I did not know who this individual was. And so obviously, personally, quite embarrassed about uh, applauding someone who, uh, who was part of uh, was, who was, who was part of Waffen SS division in the Galician group um, that has its own distinct history. Um, I think we we're all embarrassed by that. I, I am glad that 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 the um, that the, I was just speaking in French. The président de la Chambre was mm -hmm. uh, the Re Anthony Roda, the speaker. Good heavens, um, recognized his responsibility in this. I, you know, not too many Canadians know exactly how the functioning, inner functioning of the House of Commons works. Uh, this is within the, the discretion of the chair, trying to make it into a political play to try to paint this on the back of Justin Trudeau is. Uh, is highly opportunistic, characteristic of Pierre Polyev in particular. There are responsible ways, if you're the leader of the opposition, at getting to the bottom of this and getting the fact uh, pattern that that happened here to show all Canadians how this unacceptable event occurred. Uh, but I don't think, once again, Mr. Polyev is being all that responsible about it. It's but sort but of true to is, fashion. is there no responsibility on behalf of the PMO to make sure that for, for basic security purposes, Mr. Zelensky is protected, that there is no uh, questionable person in the House of Commons at any given time? Uh, well, if, you know, it, it, two different things there, the difference between questionable and, and security. We're talking about a 97-year-old man. I, I don't think anyone is alleged to, that, that he was dangerous, certainly um, with uh, highly spotted history and shouldn't have been there and, and much obviously should never have been pointed out or asked to stand and then applauded for his uh, his war service. So I think that is what we need to focus on, Michael. Uh, this was obviously a, a visit from President Zelensky that is, was historic in nature uh, and there is a war that is ongoing and you know mistakes do happen so uh, i think getting to the bottom of that is first the first step that we have to take and, and, and not resort to hyperbole i think we are all embarrassed um prime minister included at, at applauding this individual who had no business being in the house mm -hmm. now as you know mr zelensky delivered this powerful speech on friday but that visit his visit is now being used by the kremlin for propaganda purposes to discredit canada and ukraine does the speaker need to resign? Well, I, I prefer not to speak about that at this point. Um, it is something that um, obviously he's regretted and taken full responsibility for. The, the speaker in the House of Commons at all times, but particularly in a situation where you're in a minority, needs to have the confidence of the House. Um, and um, I'll keep my own reflections on that private for the moment. Okay. Uh, I appreciate you talking about that. But listen, let's move on to immigration now. We know your government uh, has set very ambitious targets when it comes to bringing in new Canadians. Uh, but those targets, as you know, have come under greater, uh, greater scrutiny as Canada's housing crisis becomes more acute. Did your government fail to account for the impact increased immigration numbers would have? Yeah, probably just a few disagreements with the premise first, Michael. I, you know, clearly we have volumes in this country that are unprecedented of of, uh, of immigration. I think that's a good thing. It means growth of our uh, domestic product, gross domestic product that we that are, that are is driven almost entirely by by new immigration. If you look at the entrance into the workforce for the last year, ninety plus percent is, is is due to immigration. So that's a good thing. Uh, and I don't think anyone would ever argue to diminish or reduce the gross domestic product of this country. Uh, but we do have to plan for it. And I think 
when we talk about the housing crunch, this is something that's been happening over the last 30 to 40 years in successive governments, liberal, conservative, uh, provincial governments that have the prim primary responsibility have failed in various measures to, to plan for this growth in population. Um, simply putting it on the back of immigration is, I think, um, generally careless, not to diminish the volume that's coming into the country, but we have, and we make the mistake of only looking at the demand side of things as opposed to the supply side of things. These are people that help grow the country. Um, they create businesses. I've given the example before of the growth in, in Halifax due to entrepreneurship in the Lebanese community. Um, these people do build the country and we need specialized workers, specialized trades. You see that in the unions uh, crying out for help internationally. So we can't get these things built if we don't have uh, a well thought through immigration stream. Now, I think people always look at the large number and they and they jump hard to digest. But when you break it down into the things that we control, obviously economic migration, which is very important, it actually brings capital into this country. And we look at family re reunification, which is just so critical for the uh, for families and, and people for which we have an exceedingly large demand that we can't meet. Um, no one would ever propose reducing these things. And then, of course, in the face of um, some of the most historic mass migration in the world, the need for Canada to do its part and to welcome people humanely in a humanitarian but we are But we are hearing more stories of, but we are hearing more stories of, for example, refugees sleeping in homeless shelters or on the street because, you know, they can't find housing. Does this country, at the very least, need to rethink the kind of supports migrants uh, receive when they come to Canada? I think we need to have absolutely. I mean, we we definitely have to have a conversation with uh, with our own counterparts within the federal government, with with provincial governments. A lot of them are presently sitting on massive surpluses that they're not deploying into this area of responsibility. It's a bit of an irony to me at times, Michael, when I hear uh, my provincial counterparts tell me that international students are the sole responsibility of provincial governments. Uh, but by that same stroke, tell me that uh, refugees and asylum seekers are entirely the responsibility of uh, the federal government. The only difference between the two is one has money and the other doesn't. Um, and I think that is some, a discussion that we need to continue to have. And we have to do this in a way that actually works towards making sure people have a roof over their heads. That includes um, specific housing for those that uh, you know put everything on the line to get to a country that is safe like Canada, but also in the long term. Because make no mistake, all of these people end up contributing to the future of the country and the face and color of this country. And they are, uh, they are a net positive of this country, but we are facing challenges like, um, like any other country in the world, even though we are a much harder country to actually physically reach than, uh, than say Italy or other European countries that are facing uh, real challenges. But I think we can do it. And I think that's the positive side of it. We, we can do it as a country. It just takes coordination and we can't pinpoint one sort of spike in time in immigration and, um, and asylum seeking to uh, a crisis that has been in the making for about 30 and 40 years. Okay, listen, I've got less than a minute, but I do want to ask you, because you speak about Canada's need for immigrants uh, to fund programs, economic growth, CPP, but, you know, Canada is competing with other countries, in particular for healthcare workers and highly skilled immigrants. Does this country need to repair its, repu its reputation? We, we're now hearing stories of refugees on the street, new Canadians struggling to find affordable and safe housing, professionals who come to make a contribution but are stuck in work beneath their, uh, their training. Does Canada need to begin some type of repair job internationally to attract the kind of immigrants that we actually want? Well, I, I would focus that question more in, on, on who we are as people, I think, um, for our own sense of humanity, we have to do a better job in welcoming people. Um, internationally, when we make promises to people and we say, hey, come to Canada, we actually have to match those those skills to uh, to what they actually what people actually do when they come to this country, obviously, with provincial regulation and their constitutional rights over the regulation of industries, provinces have a job to make sure that they are matching those skills um, and, and the professional requirements that we sometimes impose on these highly regulated professions. So yes, there's there's work to do. I wouldn't say Canada, Canada has a damaged reputation. It's actually quite the contrary. And, and the data that we see in terms of people wanting to come here proves it. Uh, when I talk to my, my counterparts uh, in, in other countries, we are a model for them uh, that they that they want to that they would like to imitate and replicate in their own countries, and they look at, at our models in order to do it. Doesn't mean that we don't have uh, challenges to to face, and um, and sometimes things do go wrong, uh, but we do it in a mature fashion, and, and and we can fix this on the fly. I think, Michael. Um, but again, I look at this from a 
point of view of, of, of human dignity and, and, and making sure that we are actually matching uh, the hope that we are asking, you know, providing to people when they want to come to this country and then what they actually do. And um, mm-hmm. there's, always, there's, there's always opportunities to adjust that. Minister Mark Miller, always appreciate the time. Thank you for this. Thank you, Michael.